In the last video, we mentioned net metering, and it is a key factor in a thing called microgrids. Microgrids are small local versions of the big grid. So you have uh, many small systems, each generating their own power, each with their own controls, connected to each other across uh, what acts like a sort of a local grid. And these are becoming more and more common as we have more and more renewable energy and distributed power sources. They act like uh, virtual power plants, if you will. And these microgrids that are connected in networks of networks are like um, a mathematical phenomenon called the scale-free network. That is uh, just a fascinating field of study. So the internet across the globe is a scale-free network with people connected to each other and uh, nobody in charge. Scale-free networks are found throughout the world. Uh, human brain cells are scale-free networks. The networks of um, mushroom threads in the soil, mycorrhizal networks, are scale-free networks. And even in galaxies and uh, clusters of superclusters of galaxies connected by filaments, those are scale-free networks. They are really everywhere, as the name implies, at all scales. They're scale-free. So anyway, that's how distributed um, microgrids work. The power generation happens near the customer. So you might have a store with your own solar panels. You might have a house with your own solar panels. You might have a community wind farm generating power for your town. And you also have forms of storage because some of these systems, like solar systems, um, produce DC power and they need battery storage. Even the wind farms, wind doesn't blow all the time. So when the wind's not blowing, you need that power to have been stored in batteries so you can call upon the storage when you need it. And then there are controls that pull all this together. When you have sensors and what you call intelligent controls, you have what's called a smart grid. And a smart grid is a microgrid that has this two-way communication. And what's good about that is uh, you in your house, your, your equipment in your house, can you can have a meter that runs both directions. You can call for power off the grid when you need it or give it back when you don't need it. Uh, everybody can balance the load. And you can avoid um, peak, peak loads, which create demand for more power plants. These smart grids are really powerful in um, avoiding high peak loads and balancing everything out. Storage is an important part of these smart grids, including storage in electric vehicles. And let me back up to this earlier picture here, because I think it's a better picture. Um, batteries in electric cars function as small storage places for your microgrid. So when you're plugged in, you might be charging your car, so you're drawing power off of your local grid. And then when you're all charged up, you might be giving power back to your local grid if you choose to. If you're connected in a distributed microgrid network, you need the ability to connect with the main grid when you want to, but to isolate from the grid when you need to, because 
you don't want the rest of the grid sucking all the power that you've produced. We need it all to be uh, balanced and everybody to have what they need. And that is called islanding. Islandability means you can separate from the main grid if you need to. There are laws in the U.S. that um, result in islanding. There are electrical standards. IEEE has written a standard here that establishes islanding for distributed microgrids. Um, we don't need to hash over what that is, but just know that uh, everything works. <laughs> and now two examples. The University of California, San Diego, it runs on a microgrid. And so here is a diagram, uh, a simplified version of how their thing works. Here's another simplified version of how their thing works. But whatever, they produce 82% of all the power they use on their own site. They have a smart grid with sensors and net metering, of course, and uh, these are the three methods of generating power that they rely on the most. Combined heat and power, solar panels, and hydrogen fuel cells. One last example is the biggest user of renewable energy in the country I'm not sure if it's in the world, but it's in the, in the country, is the U.S. military. They are really serious about uh, resilience and being able to have power no matter what happens. So they are putting a lot of energy into developing microgrids. I read a book about that um, this summer from the U.S. military where they're talking about, here's how you do it, here's all the technical stuff. Um, they are darn serious about making sure that they can island and be self-reliant when they need to and that they can connect with the grid when they need to. And um, one of their um, project names is spiders here. <laughs>